Just You're not the it. average American woman, Megan, admit it. <laughs> well, here's what I would say about that. Well, we're talking, but... Yes, but where's the action? Yeah. Um, words are easy. I wish I had an answer for that. How do you identify with the character Rachel? You know, she is uh, equally ambitious. You can be the visionary of your own life. Would Meghan Markle make a good politician? Ideally, a politician gives clear, specific, and well thought out logical arguments so that people realize that the politician knows what he or she is talking about, and more importantly, so that people are guaranteed fair and beneficial policies. Unfortunately, we don't see that very often. Many times, image matters more to politicians than telling the truth and doing what's necessary and good. How does Meghan talk about the causes she says she advocates for? Are her arguments consistent and logical? Let's find out. Would Meghan make a good politician? Let us know what you think. Stay tuned until the end where there's a surprise clip, an example of good rhetoric. If you liked the video, click the like button and make sure you're subscribed for more authentic and organic videos. Time to get the show on the road. In light of this video's focus, Meghan's interview with Larry King is even more revealing. In the following, we enter the conversation as Meghan's explaining her UN trip to Africa and what a trip it was. You know, even I go to Rwanda again on Monday um, with World Vision actually this time to talk about a water campaign and people would typically say, well, what does water have to do with women's rights and where is the correlation there? She says rights, so the answer she's about to give should involve the correlation between water and rights. But is that what we see? I think what's been really interesting is it's all so interconnected and when you look at something like that you say, Okay, well, building wells, sure, you have the water and you have the life source, but what it also does is enables young girls to not have to walk miles to get water for their family, and instead they're able to stay in school, and that education is going to foster them being able to be very active in their society and empower female leadership. She changed the correlation from rights to leadership. It's one thing to have rights, that should be a given. It's another thing to talk and make judgments about leadership, and how water is allegedly the way to leadership. As a politician then, Megan's just revealed that she wouldn't only be advocating for rights, which could be translated to equality of opportunity, but also advocating for certain people to end up as leaders, even in other countries and cultures. The presupposition in Megan's statements is that leadership is what it's all about. We don't hear her talking about working hard, earning it, or even just the benefits of having a job. No, it's leadership. More importantly, she doesn't take the cultural aspect into account. She's speaking from a very much modern Western perspective, perspective which reveals what she values above all else, leadership, kind of like another actress. And we absolutely wrote a Snow White that she's is not going to be yeah, saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. It's almost as if they want to be members of the same club or something. You know, like the buzzword club. Immediately after this, Megan's asked about the biggest obstacles for the cause she advocates for, or gets paid to say she advocates for. Her answer is very revealing. What are the biggest obstacles? You know, I think the biggest obstacles are perhaps people being set in their ways. Entrenched. Having, sure, you know, like having a very clear, be it from what you learn at home, or what you're comfortable with. Change is difficult for people, and People being set in their ways and comfortable with, she says, before repeating one of the most vague and therefore most popular political slogans of all time. Change. Do terms like these display a thorough understanding of the cultures she wants to change? Does she look at the world from their perspective? No, she looks at the world with? from a modern perspective with terms like comfortable and change that people who struggle to survive don't have the luxury to even think about. But as always with these interviews, there's more. A lot more. You know, you watch some of these fathers or men who are supporting their wives or daughters in this, and perhaps in some communities, those men are shunned by their friends saying, what are you doing? You're upsetting a norm that's been comfortable for us. So it takes a lot of courage for anyone to be able to, <clears throat> excuse me, fight against what has been customary and say, even if we've been doing this for a long time, doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing that we should be doing. And I think it's time for change. There we have it. Megan thinks it's time for change. The statement underlines what we've observed so far. She projects what she wants onto the cultures that she visited on a brief vacation. 
without sufficient observations to decide how these cultures should be changed. This change is first and foremost are only tied to Megan's own ambitions. This is about taking popular words and applying them to so-called causes that she hasn't made sufficient observations to say anything definitive about. This, unfortunately, is how many politicians operate, more concerned with their image and career than making informed statements and decisions. The fact that Megan's out of touch with the very same people she allegedly advocates for is exposed by the strangely convenient fictional dialogue. Saying, what are you doing? You're upsetting a norm that's been comfortable for us. A norm that's been comfortable for us. Aside from the condescending tone and the assumption of bad intent, these aren't the words of most or any men in these cultures. They're the result of Megan's wishful thinking as she's speaking in a modern context. And when I say modern, I don't necessarily mean good. Not at all, actually. It's wishful thinking because this fictional dialogue is an oversimplifying way for Megan to advance her cause and thus advance her career. Oversimplifications and convenient conclusions belong in the realm of politics, unfortunately. Things get unintentionally funny when we compare this to what she said just a minute earlier. It, it's, all in, it's all relative to where we're talking about and what's challenging when you ask a question like that is that you have to take into account the cultural context, right? Yeah. The irony. However, with her question, she's asking rather than stating, so she doesn't sound entirely convinced of this herself, which corresponds to what we've seen so far, that the cultural dimension isn't Megan's biggest concern or concern at all. It's challenging because I don't want to put that judgment on some things that certain cultures are comfortable with. She says this right after she's just emphasized change. So which is it? The answer is neither, because this isn't about strong principles and morality. It's about making nice-sounding, career-advancing speeches for the sake of image. The substance is lacking, which is true for most political speeches and monologues. Andrew Scheer wants to scrap the first and only national climate plan Canada has ever had, and we will always do more to fight climate change. <laughs> The world is changing fast, but our top priority will always remain building a better today and tomorrow for you and for your kids. This is the foundation of everything we do. For contrast, here's how I make sure to give my employees honest and heartfelt answers. Sir? Yes? I don't know if I should be asking about this. What is it? You can ask me anything. My tolerance is matched only by my generosity. It's just that I've been working overtime every day for the past five months. Yes. Would it be possible for me to get paid for those extra hours? Just for some of them, of course. Do you remember the pillars that this company is founded on? Yes, sir. What are they? Let's hear them. Inclusion, representation, maximizing your potential. Exactly, maximizing your potential. Now it's the company's belief that you can only maximize your potential by maximizing the company's potential. The only way to maximize the company's potential is to be a team player. And when you're a team player, you act in the best interest of the company, not your own. So, tell me, are you a team player? Yes, sir. I want to make sure. Are you a team player? Yes, sir. Good. Let me know if you have any other questions. We're here to help each other. It's my experience that honest and heartfelt answers guarantee happy employees. Megan has a very politician-like way to respond to questions she's not comfortable with, to use her terminology. Uh, what do you make of it uh, uh, locally here? What do you make of it when you see things like uh, Academy Awards and mm. women don't get the same pay and they don't get the same shots at directing as men? Right. In other words, why not faster in women men? Well, we're certainly talking about it enough. Well, no, we're talking, but... Yes, but where's the action? Yeah. Um, Words are easy. I wish I had an answer for that. I believe that. She wishes she had an answer for that. 
So when there's no answer, what's the next best thing? To act as your own interviewer, to make sure that the questions are comfortable. I mean, certainly when it comes to the pay gap, it's staggering, right? And I think um, it is nonsensical. Do I have personal experience with it? Absolutely. Um, do I hope to see that change the more that we're talking about it and being very comfortable in those conversations? Yes. It's impressive how such a short clip can raise so many questions. What's staggering, specifically? What's nonsensical and why, specifically? And what is Megan's experience with this subject that hasn't even been properly defined? And where's her proof? All of these considerations are left out of Megan's statements, exposing them for what they are. Filler, because no real answer is available, apparently. Megan continues emphasizing ideology, or pretend ideology, the kind of ideology that comes with career-advancing financial incentives. But, you know, between Jennifer Lawrence and that great op-ed that she wrote about it, or, you know, Patricia Arquette being vocal about, I mean, it is now becoming more of the conversation. I think that is, you know, I'm not going to criticize the speed in which it's taking for it to happen. My hope is that it just happens. Hope that what happens, exactly? All Megan did was reference what actresses have said, without offering proof for their claims. So this is covert argumentation. With covert argumentation, the speaker doesn't prove her presuppositions, but simply presupposes them in the claims she makes. Also, it's very telling that Megan deliberately overlooks the market, which movies and celebrities people want to see, because obviously celebrities that people want to see make more money. Megan's view is entirely ideological. The world should conform to what she wants, not what people want. It's not a matter of fair or unfair. For studios and companies, it's a matter of money and making ends meet. You don't give anyone more money on the basis of their innate characteristics, but on the basis of their ability to make money. And who's more profitable for studios and companies? The celebrities that people want to see, irrespective of their innate characteristics. However, there are career-advancing incentives to act as if it's the 1930s. Megan obviously knows that. She's even more uncomfortable with the next question. Have you seen any personal effects of it? Has it ever affected you? You know, it's so interesting, and I actually, I gave a speech um, last year for International Women's Day with UN Women. Larry's question makes sense, considering that Megan just finished saying that she has personal experience with this. He doesn't even phrase it as, what's your personal experience with this, which would have been a presupposition question, forcing the interviewee to mention specific situations. He phrases it as a dichotomy question with plenty of room for Megan to answer as she sees fit. But still, Megan treats it as an uncomfortable question. While stroking her left arm and closing her eyes, she starts with the expression, you know, you know so which indicates acute self-awareness, an awareness of the other person in the room. So Coupled with the I... words, it's so interesting. This is Megan's way of admitting that the story that's about to follow differs from Larry's question. And yes, it's that story, but because I'm a good person, a quite inclusive one at that, I've shortened it. You know, to suit everybody's needs. No pun intended, of course. Notice the complete mismatch between question and answer, something we see in political interviews on an hourly basis. And I was talking about an experience that I had when I was 11 years old. And the class was very small, and we were watching TV, and this commercial came on for a soap manufacturer, an ivory dishwashing liquid. And in the tagline of the commercial, it said, women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. And two of the boys in my class said, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. And whatever it was in me, at 11 years old, it sparked this frustration and this desire for change and I went home and I said to my dad this is crazy and this can't I have to do something and he said why don't you write some letters so Larry I wrote a letter to Hillary Clinton who was our first lady at the time uh, I wrote a letter to Gloria Allred <laughs> <laughs> what was so interesting was to then see with this support behind me they changed the commercial to people all over America it's interesting that Megan's constantly guiding people to think what's interesting about her interesting stories you know what's so interesting? What was so interesting? Ironically, when stories are actually interesting, there's no reason to say what's interesting about them. It's obvious. This speaks volumes about how preoccupied Megan is with image, how she wants people to perceive her. 
They were talking about a pay gap without defining or even mentioning all the independent variables that go into that discussion. Megan was asked if it had ever affected her, and she uses a story which is more than two decades old, has nothing to do with payment, and involves questionable claims. And two of the boys in my class said, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. It's convenient how everyone says things that enforce Megan's narrative. This part reminds me of the fictional dialogue. Saying, what are you doing? You're upsetting a norm that's been comfortable for us. It doesn't sound oversimplifying at all. All in all, this is an evasive answer, masked as a specific answer. Evasion, which is a standard part of politicians' media training, even though they use a nicer term for what they do. I think one thing a lot of people don't know about the new trade agreement, uh, USMCA, if you will, is that there's actually a chapter on gender equality in there. What does it do? We've, we've brought in stronger protections for environmental rights, labor rights, women's rights, indigenous rights uh, than just about Trade creates growth. It just doesn't guarantee that it gets who, shared who properly. Made, in these negotiations, who made the case for the gender part of this deal? Well, the, the entire focus of these trade negotiations was to on my end, making sure that we had something that worked for the middle class, because that's what I got elected on, but by people who, who didn't feel included in, in the growth of the but United I'm, States. Did you, did your team, Katie, Telford, et cetera, did, I mean, did one of you lay out, okay, there has to, this has to address gender as well? We have, we have been negotiating new progressive trade deals for a while now. It was a big part of our ability to secure a free trade deal with Europe. Megan's initial words foreshadowed the evasion. Has ever affected you? You know, it's so interesting, and I actually, I gave a speech, um... So it can, it can do things at 11. At 11, with pen to paper. So you think about what we can do now, right? And the access we have with our voices to be heard through social media and everything else. I think it's a really good example of what we can do. If you watch some of my previous videos, you know that one of my recurring points is that Megan has a script, certain buzzwords and platitudes that she repeats. Because as all politicians know, people tend to remember the positive emotions they felt when they heard a specific word, rather than asking themselves about the substance of what the politician actually said. Politicians and celebrities bank on that. Access and voice are both well-known terms in that regard. And it was incredibly inspiring, the resounding themes that came up about representation, about inclusion, about access. You'll often hear people say, well, you're helping women find their voices. And I fundamentally disagree with that because women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice, they need to feel empowered to use it, and people need to be encouraged to listen. Good a good example of what, what we, we can, can do, do, she says, ignoring what this example has to do with the conversation about payment. What exactly is Megan advocating for? Making laws to strengthen the power of government and diminish the power of the market. We can only speculate because this kind of rhetoric isn't about solutions or truth but image. Next, we go from a conversation about the show Suits to a conversation about looks. It seems that everything's possible in this empowering conversation. Personally, what's being said here truly makes an impact on me, and I'm starting to get emotional. Do you with them from the start? Yes, from day one. How do you identify with the character Rachel? You know, she is uh, equally ambitious and opinionated, so I think that for me is a really nice commonality. But I've just loved playing her for so many years now. It's made it really comfortable, and, and I really respect the character. That word comfortable again, revealing Megan's mindset, how she wants everything to be comfortable to her. No matter if we're talking about other cultures or the monumental milestone that Suits truly was. However, is Megan telling the whole truth? I don't cry as much as Rachel does. I don't think anyone does. Oh gosh. Um, how do you cry? Yes, it totally sounds like she respects her character. Are you looking to do other things? Yes, like of course. Full features? And I would love to do that. You know, we film almost nine months out of the year, so it's a really small window of a hiatus to be able to do other projects. And in that, I really want to do something passion, purpose, purpose driven. Just like politicians have words and phrases they repeat ad nauseum under the motto, when people hear something enough times, they start to believe it. Megan uses certain words for image purposes. Purpose driven is one of them. It's really interesting because if you don't listen to all the noise out there and you just focus on living a purpose-driven life. Also, well, do you get typecast? You know, 
I don't know yet. I certainly yeah, how, get, how would you know? Yeah, how would I? I mean, like, especially because I've been on the show for so long. But I hope that people are able to see something beyond that character specifically. Megan's smile fades as she seems to realize that the rhetorical question, how would you know, doesn't portray her acting career in a favorable light. She's quick to make the modification. How would I? I mean, like, especially because I've been on the show for so long. Just in case we couldn't figure out why. This is another thing politicians do, constantly turning a negative, a potential negative, into a positive. If we hadn't got the federal government back into the business of housing, then everything would be much worse right now. So we actually kept things you know, on a slightly better track than they are, but there is so much more to do, and that's exactly what we're doing. Can you see how that's cold comfort to a young person stuck in their parents' basement or in a basement apartment, yeah. and they can't get out of the apartment yeah. because if they do, then they're going to see their rent double. You know, how would you respond to that? That that it's, it's, it's not been anywhere near enough. enough. Oh, I, I will say it hasn't been enough, and that's why we're doing much more. Does, do you think your looks affect your advocacy? Well, you know, I think this is You're part of... You're not the average American woman, Megan, admit it. <laughs> well, I would like to think that I, I am. Okay. okay. Well, here we go. Here's what I would say about that. I think... Um, it's very important to shift this idea that... You know, one would say, okay, you're coming on to Larry King, so, and you're doing politicking, so maybe wear a blazer and play the opposite and make sure you can be taken seriously. My point in all of this is that no matter what you look like, you should be taken seriously. No matter what you look like. Really. You go first. No, uh -uh, no, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go, you go first. Go. But that's the thing with Megan and politicians. It's always the easy, feel good solutions. You are enough exactly as you are, I think is really important to remind ourselves of. That is a very important message. It's one thing to want this to be how the world works. It's another thing to expect the world to conform to your ideals. You can't negotiate with reality. In theory, I could show up in a theater dressed in waiters and expect to be taken seriously. But it doesn't mean people would take me seriously. This is an extreme example, but the principle is relevant because Megan doesn't qualify her nice sounding fairy tale like claims. Is feminism still a good, I'm a feminist, I've been a feminist all my life. That's fantastic. I don't hear about it, I don't hear it said much as, as it used to be. Well, I think it's really, it had Gloria a... Gloria Steinem in her prime. Of course, I mean, I think that it's really shifted because at the onset it was getting a bad rap. It, and seemed to be like women burning their bras and this perception of how it's evolved since then has changed and last year I think it was sort of a of the moment kind of word that people were trying to define a bit more and to embrace it again in a different way to not have some sort of negative connotation with it. I don't think there's anything negative about being a feminist. How did it evolve? How did they embrace it? Did they just decide that it's not a bad thing anymore and expect everybody to follow suit? No pun intended. This demonstrates Megan's way of thinking. It's more about saying the words than giving tangible specifics. Saying the words means direct access to the buzzword club of politicians, celebrities and other great people. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Larry. This is how Megan speaks in interviews, but what about speeches? The following is a case study in the surface level rhetoric that's so popular in politics. You can be the visionary of your own life. The authenticity level of that statement is off the charts. By the way, thanks for the guide to get there. You can charter a path in which what you repeat in your daily acts of service, in kindness, in advocacy, in grace, and in fairness. Anything else? That those become the very things that are recognized by the next wave of women, both young and old, who will also choose this moment to join the movement and make our vision for an equitable world reality. This moment, as in the moment of this event, or right now watching the event, this stuff's confusing. Advocating for causes is a good thing if it's done the right way, with rhetoric that feels relevant to our lives, is specific and isn't divisive. A lot of what Megan says can come across as divisive because she makes unsubstantiated claims and doesn't properly include all or most demographics in her rhetoric. Quite the contrary, actually. For contrast, let's end the video by watching how Catherine promotes courses. Megan and Catherine have a shared history. A few days before the wedding, she was upset about something. 
and it made me cry and it really hurt my feelings. But a vastly different approach is to promoting their causes. People often ask why I care so passionately about the early years. Many mistakenly believe that my interest stems from having children of my own. And while of course I care hugely about their start in life, this ultimately sells the issue short. Parenthood isn't a prerequisite for understanding the importance of the early years. If we only expect people to take an interest in the early years when they have children, we are not only too late for them, we are underestimating the huge role others can play in shaping our most formative years too. I've seen that experiences such as homelessness, addiction and poor mental health are often grounded in a difficult childhood. But I have also seen how positive protective factors in the early years can play a critical role in shaping our futures too. Because the science shows that the early years are more pivotal for future health and happiness than any other period in our lifetime. Which is why I wanted to start a society-wide conversation. To hear what people across the UK think about the early years too. Overall, we're able to conclude that Meghan has many and most of the traits that characterise modern day politicians. What do you think about the clips we've seen? See you next time for a video that's as inclusive as it is empowering. Maybe even a little more inclusive than empowering. But it's still empowering though. <laughs>